Boa noite a todos, bem-vindos é, à nossa segunda palestra do Neane. É, eu estou começando a falar em português, mas nós vamos passar para o inglês muito em breve, porque o nosso convidado é, é, vai falar dos Estados Unidos. É, eu só, é, antes de passar para o inglês, gostaria de dar um aviso para os brasileiros né, que estão é, assistindo, que podem fazer é, suas perguntas é, né, com relação à palestra nos comentários, é, seja em português como em inglês, que nós podemos depois é, traduzir, tá certo? Então, obrigada, so let's start over. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, and welcome uh, to the second uh, Nian uh, lecture. Uh, so Nian is a, a study uh, center focused on non-European art, and it's a joint uh, initiative between the University of Campinas and Tufts University. Um, so now I will uh, pass uh, the mic to my uh, colleague Claudia, and she can present uh, our very distinguished guest tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Welcome, everyone. My name is Claudia Matos Avolesi, and I'm um, very, very honored to present my colleague and friend, Professor Elohi Guzman, who is a senior lecturer for visual studies at Tufts University. He's a specialist in pre-Columbian art, uh, particularly um, dealing with architecture and sculpture of the Mexica. He's also uh, a specialist in colonial Mexico and um, a colleague of mine. <laughs> um, El is also um, a part of the Getty program that is supporting Neani as well as a series of courses, joint courses, online courses that is, are happening on non-Western art um, uh, that will benefit several universities in Brazil as well as Tufts. Um, I, we are really, really happy to have you here, Elohi, with us. Thank you so much for your time and uh, for being here tonight. Um, your mic is off. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is a great pleasure to be here tonight uh, to be able to share this talk with you. I'm uh, very um, thankful to both Patricia and to Claudia for this wonderful, generous uh, opportunity to share this presentation with you tonight. Um, and um, maybe I, it, we should just start, right? I, mm -hmm. I can just launch into it. OK, great. I was. <laughs> thank you. And uh, I'll just say advance every time we move forward with, uh, with an image. So if you could advance to the first one, please. Is, am I, oh, or am I I think it? you're the <laughs> one that has to. <laughs> Sorry, um, is that, did that change? Not yet. I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out where I'm able to advance that. Uh, just the arrows yeah. down. It should be. Okay. Oh, I see there. Yeah. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. This is an entirely new platform for me. So, um, great. Terrific. Um, current debates on monuments center on the ongoing collective actions of quickly assembled, socially conscious crowds who seek to undo the asymmetrical legacies of colonialism by toppling, defacing, or publicly lampooning sculptures as responsive actions of immediate visual symbolic justice and social reckoning. This communal teardown of Goliath is an emblematic battle that has occurred through the ages and illustrate how these immense material expressions through their stature and placement excel in ideological meaning that often outlasts the actual regimes that planned and supervised physical creation of such works. Monuments stand as colossal mar markers of strength and are compliance making their public collapse great political theater synonymous with dramatic social change. This presentation intersects with these fascinating topics by examining the rise of Mexica mon monumentality in their visual culture as an expression of their grand imperial strategies of expansion into, as well as incorporation and ingestion of, the vast topographical territory and diverse cultural polities they ambitiously sought to dominate. 
The Mexica ingeniously defined a monumental visual program that hitched their hegemonic ideal to the perpetual growth of the principal civic religious structure, the Templo Mayor. It was a behemoth that endlessly grew in form and visual articulation through, massively through a massively constructed sculptural program. I will argue that this architectural colossus, incessantly rising like the Leviathan from the waters of Lake Texcoco, was interminably nurtured by the Mexica through a steady diet of carefully curated, donated cultural materials presented in offerings within the bowels of this edifice. The combination of the Templo Mayor, studded with sizable sculpture and its accompanying spatial envelope, filled with semi-private cultural deposits, created a vibrant political religious terrain that brilliantly communicated their intentions of expansion and incorporation. And that's what you're seeing here. You see a, an exploded view and a cut view of the Temple Mayor on the left-hand side. In the middle, you see this monument that's known as the Kurashaki disk. I'll discuss it in, um, later in the talk. And you get a sense of the, the, the largeness of that monument by the uh, archeologist Diana Valkner, who was working on it, who then uh, they're cl um, clearing it. And then on the right-hand side, a much smaller offering. Um, the offering is, is um, you get a little bit of a sense with the arrow up above in the clipboard. It's just, it's much, much smaller. In my conclusion, I argue that in spite of the cataclysmic demise, the exposed ruined vestiges first unearthed in 1978 and continuously since show how collective acts of destruction during conquest were not entirely successful in decimating the imposing visual imprint of the Mexica. The Mexica were outsiders. Right there. The Mexica were outsiders. They were the last of many Nahua ethnic groups to enter into the basin of Mexico during a 100 year migration of northern invaders driven south due to extreme drought conditions from their collective mythical origin of Aztlan. The Tepanek were the first Nahuas to arrive, rapidly subjugating Otomipame groups already in the basin, taking their lands and incorporating their, their customs and gods. Other major groups to settle the area were the Kulua, descendants of the mythical Toltec who worshiped the other titular, titular deity of the land, the god of rain slash storm, Tlaloc. Every group to settle the basin established cities or large settlements. The Tepanek built their capital, Azcapotzalco, in a network of towns on the western shore of Lake Texcoco, while the Kulua founded their capital city of Texcoco on the eastern shore. The political landscape around this basin grew intensely contentious with each arriving group. Major territorial battles were fought and perpetual enemies created, but the Tepaneca emerged as the bellicose powerhouse of the lakeshore region. When the Mexica arrived at the end of the 13th century, few open areas remained to settle, and after a number of failed attempts, they finally found a place in 13 AD 1325 for their people in the middle of Lake Texcoco. Disappointingly for them, the marshes were Tepanic territory, so the Mexica embarked on a political campaign to earn their right to remain in the swampy terrain. Not much to really um, really, really kind of benefit from, but nevertheless, the Mexica became Tepanic mercenaries. Together, they established Tepanic dominion over the many basin polities. Simultaneously, the Mexica orchestrated a number of strategic marriages with all major adversaries, including the Tepanic and Kulua royal houses, to curry favor with every established power and grow their political influence. In 14, in 1427, under the leadership of Iscoa, the Mexica struck boldly. They led a coalition force of exploited Tepanic polities in a series of bloody skirmishes to defeat their overlords and overturn their subjugated status. Leading the Tepanic defeat made the Mexica sole definitive lords of the internecine terrain. In a stroke of genius, the sagacious Iscoa recognized that any Mexica dominance would be temporarily and repeatedly contested, unless he could build a hegemonic confederacy. 
He placed at the head the two dominant powers of the Tepanek and Kulua houses alongside of the Mexica to establish a government run by a council of lords comprised of nobles from many ruling houses, but led by a Mexica majority, which came to be known as the Triple Alliance. And this wonderful um, image from the um, Codex Osuna, as you can see on the right-hand side, illustrates the three toponyms with the three royal houses, the, the Mexico Tenochtitlan at the center, um, Tlacopan on the left, and Azcapotzal um, on the right. And there you have them actually laid out in, in, the, um, in, the, in the lake. This triumvirate would face continuous challenges, and the Mexica devised a shrewd monumental visual campaign that was endlessly reconfigured to address all provocations. The success of these offensives led to an impressive territorial, cultural, and economic expansion that ingested much of Mesoamerica until the Spanish arrived and built a coalition of their, of their own that unraveled the corporate government of Iscoat's successor, impressively grown after him. So the establishment of an architectural platform amidst swampy, sorry, amidst marshy swamplands, which I'll try that again, um, of Lake Texcoco first visualized Mexica intentions to build a bold future in unstable, difficult terrain, which they would understood to be incessantly grown and nurtured. According to ethno-historical sources, the initial structures were made of semi-permanent materials and it was not until the reign of the third dynast, Chimalpopoca, that the first major stone temple was erected. This shows you three different drawings of what this temple would have looked like, and I'll talk about it now. In spite of its initial humbled stature, it was notably known as the Wey Teocali, or the Templo Mayor. It was not until after Chimalpopoca's successor, Scoat's um, decisive military victory and strategic political planning that the principal Mexica civic religious structure would be defined in monumental proportion. Systematic excavation of the Templo Mayor began in 1978 under the supervision of Mat Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, revealing no fewer than seven major construction phases that he, that he overwhelmingly proposed aligned with Mexica emperors. Matos' successor, Leonardo Lopez Luján, has continued to probe the Templo Mayor's vestiges to show that the seven major construction phases were supported and sustained by incessant building activity that ensured the Templo Mayor's grandiosity would endlessly rise unchallenged. What you see here on the right, and I apologize for the, for the smallness of these images, but nevertheless, um, you have both a reconstruction of the final phase of the Templo Mayor with the two crowning um, temple shrines at the very, very top and the stairs leading up to the, from the front. And then immediately to the right, of it, you have in, uh, a map of the various different excavations of what you actually see the photograph beneath. The photograph beneath shows you essentially what is found, what you will see if you go to Mexico City today. And that is, so you'll see about the first five to 10 feet of the Temple Mayor. The rest, of course, has been raised. And on the very far right, you see a chronology that's been proposed by various different scholars about how the seven phases of construction that have been uncovered align with the different regions of the Mexica Empire. Um, according to the late Alfredo Lopez Austin and, and Leonardo Lopez Luján, phase three of the Templo Mayor was the first material manifestation of the architectural principles that embodied every subsequent phase of the Templo Mayor. The edifice was defined as a solid mass with four stacked, um, let's see, let's see that actually, with four, let's see. The edifice was defined as a solid mass with four stacked rectangular bodies articulating a truncated pyramid crowned at its summit by twin temples, identical in form except that the southern one was slightly taller. A double set of stairs running parallel to each other on the western face of the structure granted access to this temple top shrine. This visual articulation will continue to be refined through later additions. The major distinction in all subsequent constructions by every dynast thereafter focused on enlarging the size of the Templo Mayor by encasing it 
in the previously the, the previous completed structure under a new superimposed larger building that was accompanied by ceaseless building adjustments. Each sizable construction was supported by large and small rubble infill that was donated by polities from all over the basin, stabilized with fine sands and finished off in forced masonry of different colors and differently shaped stones finely covered in a binding coat of fine resplendent white plaster. This process would be repeated in every subsequent version of this edifice. The incessant construction was compl complemented by continuous ritual activity, especially concentrated in rich material deposits that were presented as offerings within the valves and associated platforms of this edifice. The curation of magnificent objects placed in pits as temporal exhibits provided the Mexica elite repeated opportunities to demonstrate monumental care for the material manifestation of empire at its core structure. As Lopez Luján's impressive dissection of offerings has demonstrated, there are consistent patterns in the selection of materials and in their eternal temporary exhibition of objects. Most offerings follow strict ordering protocol of its contents set commonly in three tiers to replicate a cosmic and iconic layer of space and relevant religious precepts. What you see here is then a slight, a, an aerial view where you can see the cross sections of the various different stages of the Templo Mayor. Here's the, I don't know if it, hopefully you can see the pointer. I'm not exactly, are you able to see the pointer on here? No. No, okay. Well, sorry about that. But okay, so you have uh, the image on the left shows you uh, the series of constructions and hopefully you can see a bright white disc. And the disc mm -hmm. is that of the Koyoshaki, the very same image that is being um, uh, clean, cleaned and worked on on the top right register. And it, then the image on the bottom right is that of archaeologists excavating and finding a variety of various different offerings within the bowels of the Temple Mayor. Okay. Given that sculpture was such an integral component of the Temple Mayor and synonymous with Mexica imperial eminence, it is fitting that Matos Moctezuma used the discovery of the massive sculpted disc bearing the goddess Koyoshaki in 1978 to launch the creation of the Proyecto Temple Mayor which focused on the full exhumation and subsequent study of the building's remains. The unearthing of this prominent edifice by PTM archeologists, first under Matos's supervision and presently under Lopez Luján, has not only yielded integral information about the Mexica incessant construction of the Templo Mayor, but has brought to light a number of artworks that can be dated and studied in situ. This rare condition allows insight into the composition spatial relations and political religious symbolism behind each, each object in relation to salient Mexica historical events. The Mexica are famous for their monumental sculpture. Gigantic works like the Coyoshalki disc, the Cuatlique, um, the, or, and or the most recently discovered club, the Kutli, were designed to inspire awe upon their viewers in and of themselves but especially so in the architectural envelope they embellished in and around the monument, of the, the most prominent monument of all, the Templo Mayor. So these are three massive um, sculptures that have been discovered. Um, like I just mentioned them, the Koyoshaki disc on the left-hand side, the Kuatlikwe, and the Behemoth, um, uh, and that is to say the, this, the Tlaltecutli disc, the third one on the right, which is actually slightly just a little bit smaller than the than um, in, in in the way in which it's shown, but in actual size much larger than the first disc on the left. So you get a sense of just the monumental proportions of it. Um, in what remains, I discuss a few of the Mexica strategies of monumentality as articulated in sculptures that materialize their dominance through visual means. Given the brevity of this talk, I will order my presentation around two themes anthropomorphic presence and supernatural representation. These sculptures reflect two major temporal decision, divisions, a pre-imperial and an imperial phase. In addressing each, I will show the Mexica tirelessly, tirelessly revised, honed, and reinvented their state craft principles through a visual culture in portable and grand scales. Currently, 
anthropomorphic presence is visible throughout the corpus of Mexica visual culture. Inversely, the earliest substantial representation of a composite female figure in the archaeological record appears after the creation of the corporate government that marked the rise of the Mexica Empire. The physical growth of the Templo Mayor drove earlier superimposed stages of this edifice deeper into the marshy waters of Lake Texcoco, created, creating a constant need to race the base of this building to avoid flooding. And this image on the left-hand side that you see there shows you the various different stages. And as the, 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 the modern roof is actually set over what the earliest exposed stage, stage two. And of course, as the building would grow, the weight of the structure would push the building deeper and deeper. This would later create an unstable condition for archaeologists interested in probing the earliest building phases. Persistence led archaeologists to assume construction phase two, and while the PTM archaeologists never reached phase one, they sunk a few exploratory trenches into the bowels of the Templo Mayor. One such probe yielded a minimally carved bust hewn from volcanic rock with distorted facial features, which you now see on the right hand side, found beneath the tomb foundation and tomb foundations of phase two's northern stairway. And that's what you see here. You see the stairway which leads to the top of phase two and the pit that was sunk. And you can see in there just barely in that oval. If you look, you'll see that visage of the figure that's on outside on the right in larger. Um, um, so, see. according to Matos, the placement of this figure underneath the stage, this stage, gives it a date between 1325 and 1390, making it the earliest Mexica sculpture that can be dated and yet discovered. Dubbed chueco, meaning crooked, <laughs> uh, we Mexicans have a weird sense of humor, but at any rate, <laughs> this bust is of a figure with bulbous eyes and an exaggerated facial expression heightened by a distorted curved mouth and bean-shaped nose. Other iconographic features include blue circular discs stippled with dots on its cheek and a pillbox hat. These spare iconographic features are complemented by soft, sinuous facial modeling that heightens dramatically the distorted features which Matos tied to palsy, a medical condition that can lead to facial paralysis and is brought on by, ex by extreme exposure to dampness. Treco's size made it transportable and it may have been through, um, and it may have been brought from abroad, possibly during Mexica migration from Aslan. An illustration of this event in the Tira Turini shows a priest carrying a bundle that has a head with a bird beak cap. And you see that in this illustration at the very, very top, the figure towards the front, they all four are priests that are carrying these packs. And one of them actually has this little head. Um, I believe it's actually the last one in the back there. You can see it very clearly. At some point before its entombment under phase two platform, the bus was fixed to a small basalt rectangular base. You can see that there at, the, at the, the rectangular platform that it actually sits on. This stabilized it and made it ideal for placement atop an architectural platform. Heads were often incorporated into buildings as evident in Tlatelolco where a platform has a tenant head onto its low walls. Another such representation of heads onto structures is visible on phase two of the Templo Mayor. That is to say, in this very same platform that you see, right, that's named the phase two platform, on the right part of the, of the same platform, you now see this there on top, on the right. I will not talk about that. Um, on phase two of the Templo Mayor, a stone head with a plain facial expression and short cropped hair which designated as a, male, as a male, was found on top of a riser leading to the exposed Huitzilopochtli Southern Shrine of the Temple of Summit. Unlike Chueco, this figure bears no distortions and is accompanied by two glyphs that have spurred great debate about its, associ its associated meanings. Another stone, uh, stone figure, and now I'm gonna talk about, and so now I'm talking about 
phase two. So if you see that platform there, now I'm going to talk about the figure that's on the left-hand side leading up to the stairs, which actually you could see right above the trench where, where, where Trekkle was, right? So now I will talk about that. Um, this, this figure is a sculpted person in repose, was set atop phase two's platform in front of the northern shrine dedicated to Tlaloc. The distinctive pose, lying down, legs drawn, with head and chest lifted, links this being with the iconic sculpture type known as Chakmul, common in other cultures, including the Toltec, Maya, and the Purepecha. This full-figured being has arms at its sides and holds a bowl on its abdomen. The upper chest area unrealistically breaks vertically with its horizontal body plane to support the telescoping, perpendicularly turned head. Whoops, let me actually show you a better image of that. There, you can see it much better. The spare overall features on its face and body were lavishly dressed with elaborate painted designs that provide a wealth of information about its dress apparel and accessories, which Lopez Austin and Lopez Bucan have extensively studied and linked with Rain Priest, known as Tlaloque. <laughs> These authors identify this sculpture as an accessory used in sacrifice rituals. The fusion, uh, the, the fusion of definitive Chakmo sculpted traits with Mexica painted details demonstrates how the Mexica from early times devised forms that re reference the vast cultural landscape that lay beyond their immediate cultural surroundings. <clears throat> the Chakmul, however, is not the earliest manifestation of this interest. Treco actually is. He made direct references to other cultures. <clears throat> this time, the urban juggernaut of Teotihuacan, which the Mexica settled in for some time during their uh, migration, according to ethno-historical sources, before arriving at the basin of Mexico. A block with Treco's visage was unearthed at Teotihuacan by Matos. In spite of the spare details on the block, it is a spot, it, it is a spot on precursor to Treco. You can see the block from Teotihuacan on the left, and you can see Treco on the right. And you, as you can see that the date is almost a thousand years, uh, actually almost 1200 to 700 years before the Mexica. It might be that the Mexica were making visual references to Tihuacan. Support for this statement is found on several other material manifestations from Teotihuacan found in the offerings deposited to the Templo Mayor that include masks extracted from Teotihuacan, such as this one, which was embellished um, with inlaid eyes and shells, shell made, uh, inlaid eyes made out of shell, and the irises made by obsidian by Mexica artists. So the actual form, the actual mask, is to, of Teotihuacan manufacture, but the articulation of the eyes and actually the teeth are added constructions by the Mexica later. And this object was actually deposited and discovered in the Temple Mayor offering, so that the Mexica were actually excavating. We know different parts of Teotihuacan or taking objects from there and depositing them. Cultural references to many other cultures do not end there. They are a staple in the Templo Mayor offerings as evident in these masks from Olmec um, Guerrero Chontal and West Mexican sculptures. Cultural incorporation discussed as an archaizing or revival tactic by some scholars shows that the Mexica shrewdly groomed visual resonance as a tactic of political inclusion of the vast cultural landscape that lay beyond the political horizons of the Mexica. It is not surprising that anthropomorphic figuration was an intimate part of the Templo Mayor in this pre-imperial phase. The Mexica purposefully crafted a tactic of inclusion infusing human representation to the rising state symbol par excellence. Anthropomorphic presence continues into the imperial phase after the Mexica defeat of their or uh, overlords. Iscoat's Temple Mayor rose to new heights and with it came new substantive, substantive architectural embellishments. Including a complex of female supernaturals who became the principal embellishments of the Temple Mayor. This visual shift was memorialized in the spectacular inst installation of a group of figures commonly identified as standard bearers 
but most recently interpreted by Diego Matalamas as pulque priests that were dynamically arranged as if descending, almost running, from the steps of the Temple Mayor. And that's what you see on the right-hand side. These are these figures that are actually set. It's a little bit difficult to read here, but they are actually set. There's the different sizes, and they are staggered on the stairs. So then when you would have seen them, it would have seen as, it would have looked as if they were each coming down the stairs at different um, ways. And as you can see, this stage, stage three, is sandwiched where the arrow shows you on the right, on the farthest right-hand side between those areas of construction. And on the left-hand side, you see um, Matos Moctezuma along with archaeologists. I believe that's Diana Wagner, who are working precisely on restoration of, this, of these sculptures. Um, let's see. The kinetic composition and placement of this offering at the stairs leading to the summit of the temple um, that was about to be buried by the subsequent model, marked in all probability closure ceremonies that ritually killed and entombed phase three of the Temple Mayor while inaugurating construction of the rising behemoth of phase four construction that is attributed to Mote Kutsoma Libi Kamina. Anthropomorphic male representation would no longer visibly dominate the Temple Mayor, but this in no way implies that human surrogates disappeared. Human representation on the Temple Mayor continued, but with fewer references on the more public platform of stage, uh, public platform. Anthropomorphic males appear in these offerings in a series of compact males shown wearing a headband with, distinctive, with a distinctive truncated twin crest that were repeatedly um, uh, deposited into the offerings, starting with phase four. I have dubbed these, the, uh, the anthrop these anthropomorphic beings twin tufted figures or two tufted figures. My work on these sculptures has focused, focused on identifying the, their identities based on their stylistic differences, lightly varied but yet consistent iconographic traits, multiple volcanic rock materials and chromatic bricolage. I have argued that the similar yet distinctive traits make them grandiose materializations of political incorporation and smart power strategies devised by the Mexica to feed their incessant and ambitious aspirations of sovereignty and territoriality. My work has shown their consistent dress elements and deep associations with ruling elites. And as such, it is of no surprise that their twin crests visually resonate the Mexica's most monumental manifestation of power, the Templo Mayor. These sculptures seem to make a reference to corporate representatives that were incorporated into the fold of empire. Two tufted figures were a fundamental part of the Temple Mayor deposits, normally residing on the top layer of the offerings they inhabited, as if presiding over vast cultural and material contents of the mindfully created offerings that were deposited to this temple in honor of this temple. One of the richest offerings deposited just before the arrival of the Spanish in phase seven construction included seven of these um, fabulous beings sit amid, set amidst natural materials, fauna, and cultural objects from throughout the rich empire, starting in phase four. The Mexica would foster a public visual agenda that emphasized female supernatural composites that embodied the ferocious political challenges that the Mexica empire tried to dominate. The, uh, so now moving on to the last section, and that is the rise of the fierce supernaturals of the Templo Mayor. The first major sculptures of women appear in constructions 4A and 4B, which correspond with Iscoat's successors. The fifth Mexica ruler, Mote Kutsoma Wicamina, who governed from 1469 through 1480. Mote Kutsoma's voracious, or rather Mote Kutsoma voraciously expanded Mexica territories beyond the Valley of Mexico while considerably growing Iscoat's visual, agen visual agendas. Iscoat substantially expanded phase three platform during his reign and embellished it with a number of abstract prismatic shaped stones that were tended into its edifice. Um, um, sorry. <laughs> Lopez Lujan and Alfredo Lopez uh, Austin have shown that these, uh, these heads symbolize abstract snakes like those seen in the earlier pyramid of, the, of Tenayuca. Snake heads were fewer, but more prominently displayed on Mote Kutsoma's Templo Mayor. They grew massive in size and more complex in their iconography and strategically 
accented the most prominent architectural settings at the base of the temple near stairways and ma on major axes. These architectural accents in combination to the massive truncated pyramid shape led Matos to identify the Templo Mayor as a mythical snake hill or Guatepe. Lopez Austin and Lopez Lujan have comprehensively explored the religious association the structure had with sacred mound of creation in their mar landmark publication, Monte Sagrado Templo Mayor. Their work makes clear how, architectural, how every architectural component of the Templo Mayor expounded on the cosmogonic symbolism of the structure. According to ethno-historical sources, Guatepec was the mythical mountain where the Mexica god Huitzilopochtli was born in full armor to the supreme creator deity Cuatlicue. And it was in, at this mountain that this insolent sister Coyolxalqui was vanquished. That's who you see on the disc on the left-hand side. And you also see it on the right. I'll explain in just one second. The massive sculpted, the, the massive naked sculpture, I'm sorry, the massive sculpted snake representations on the Templo Mayor platform were not the only sculptural references to this myth. A large, simply rendered, decapitated bob relief of a headless, naked, dismembered figure with ripples on its abdomen was carved on the floor in, uh, in front of the lowest rung of the stairway leading to the summit of the Temple Mayor Shrine Construction 4A. That's what you see here on the right hand side on the bottom right. You see that very crude rendition of that woman or, or of that body being splayed. And it is at the uh, foot of the stairs. It actually laid this figure on the bottom right, lay just beneath the image that you see on the left hand side, the huge disc. And that's what's actually rendered in the plan at the very, very top. You can see the, the darkened and shaded circle. It's actually making a reference to, um, to Koyoshaki there. This disc lay just, I mean, the, the figure lay just before the floor that supported the famous later, later version of Koyoshaki disc discovered in 1978. Like the figure on that slightly later, famous monument, this being wore sandals, bracelets, and a necklace, all signs of high status individual who was being publicly executed. The figure's nakedness revealed genitalia consistent with female gender attribution. The gendered reading is confirmed by the appearance of ripples in the stomach of this being a common trope of women who have given birth. These iconographic elements and the sculptures placement at the base of the stairs of Huitzilopochtli shrine led Matos to identify this figure as an earlier decapitated sister version of the famed Koyoshalki goddess. Koyoshalki translates from the Nawa as bells on cheek. In spite of the absence of the head that is on the figure on the right hand side of the drawing in the bottom, the, uh, which is where the, the, you would find the diagnostic iconographic name of, where, of this being, the quarter body confirms that she was a victim of vicious capital punishment typically administered to women or anyone for that matter who planned against the state or challenged the might of the war god Huitzilopochtli. And Koyoshalki certainly did that. Searching to refine the chronological sequencing in this area, Lopez Mujan returned to excavate the platform and where Matos had only assigned two phases of construction, phase A, phase 4A and phase 4B, Lopez Mujan was unable to discover many, many other additional small platform extensions, especially two early ones that he identified as 4A and 4B, A, A1 and A2. So I'm sorry, that he identified as 4A1, 4A2, and then also 4A3. He identified 4A1 as the original floor that held the first Koyoshaki figure. That's the dismembered headless figure that you see on the right-hand side. Um, and phases 4A2 and 4A3 as two immediate additions that raised the floor by 40 centimeters at a time. These needed architectural adjustments provided the region Motecutsoma the opportunity to upgrade the early mo earlier monument with a new larger sculpture that confirmed Mexica might. And that's what you have there. You have the immediate replacement of the first rendition that you have there in the drawing with this mighty, uh, much more complex image, which I will now talk about. Um, PTM archaeologists have discovered remains from several other versions of Koyoshalki, like the one, the, the color image here that you see on the left-hand side, in later phases of the Templo Mayor, leading to the arrival of the Spanish. 
This magnificently reconfigured image upgraded the previous version in dynamic and new fashion that included containing the body of the dismembered woman in a pinwheel circular design carved in slightly higher relief and shows greater stylistic complexity than the earlier version. This magnificent figure would once again lie in repose as an architectural accessory to the Templo Mayor. This grand daring composition makes visible that the later Koyoshaki did not merely refine a previous theme. The newer Koyoshaki details embellish the previous narrative, making the previously defeated enemy more fierce. In the earlier version, the defeated body was limp and merely human. The new image showed the defeated figure in an active pose, signifying and even after being defeated, the vanquished posed a certain threat. The danger of this being was further underscored in the fantastic monstrous joints it had on its elbows, knees, assigning it a larger cosmic force not visible in the previous version. This new monument assured that all who saw it understood her creation was an act of greatness. This masterful adjustment demonstrated the Mexica penchant in it repeatedly exploring more effective messaging through size and manipulation and adoption of a graphic style that communicated their message of domination and defeat of insolent usurpers more effectively. Finally, to, to, to speak of the one other major figure and um, leading to my conclusion. Interestingly, the Koashaki sculptures were not the only female representations associated with this and especially later construction phases. Racing the floor twice provided the opportunity to build chambers to present offerings in honor, in honor of the building's expansion. And that's what you see in those drawings that are actually sandwiched between the plan at the very, very top with the cir hatched circular um, design. And then in the middle, you will see that there are on elevation, a series of chambers that are found and, and the one in the bottom, they show these Mexica actually luring down a monument. And that's the monument that I will now talk about. Chamber one, which is what this um, chamber is, held a rich donation of mostly portable objects with a variety of, of objects, including several anthropomorphic Mezcala Chantal figures. This rich deposit of offerings accompanied a rather large 1.32 meter greenstone block carved in low relief of a frontally facing woman with a fleshless mouth. Let me just show you that image. And that's the image on the right hand side. Two circles on her cheeks, who wore flags on her head, and a skirt with skulls and crossbones that was laid out with hands at her sides. This statue is yet a third major representation of women who have so far been largely absent in the earlier public exposed areas of the Templo Mayor. Fascinatingly, the sculpture is rendered in a third distinctive style. Here she is defined in a highly distinctive graphic style associated with the Mixteca people of Southern Puebla and Oaxaca regions. This visual incorporation resonates Mexica political expansion and illustrates the ideological shift found on the more complex Koyoshalki imagery. The sizable green stone sculpture was housed directly in the chamber immediately beneath the second step of the stairway from construction phase 4A2 and is equipped with some of the most complicated imagery found on early Mexica sculpture at the Templo Mayor up to this point. Her dress bears elaborate designs and she has a disc with a stylus radio design on her abdomen and has glyphs on her chest that include two rabbit heads and a floating head with hands splayed wearing a twisted headband and a lunar, lunar nose, nose jewel. Lopez Duhan, Carl Talbot, and Cecilia Klein have examined this complicated imagery on this being and have tied it to a number of different female deities, including Mayawel, Tzitzimi, Siwakot, and Lamatecutli, and Sitlalinique, all goddesses related to the cult of, of the intoxicating indigenous elixir, Pulque. The carving on a large block of greenstone and exotic materials with great Amerindian value that was then set into a chamber filled by abundantly rich deposits points to the importance of pulque imagery. Pulque had an intimate association with elite culture in many cultures, especially the Toltec and the Gulf Coast. Michelle Grawlich has identified many references to pulque in Mexica culture, 
and identifies this link to the great mythological deity Quetzalcoatl as an important participant in Mulpulke myths. Growlage convincingly argued that the early stages of the Templo Mayor were dedicated to Quetzalcoatl and not to Huitzilopochtli as the latter has no relation to Pulque. The effort it took to build the chamber where this very notable monument resisted, uh, rested underscores the importance of this, that the sculpture held from the Mexica. The presence marks an end ideological transformation defining respectful burial of Pulque cults embodied in Pulque priests who descended the Templo Mayor at the end of phase three and in solemn entombment of this figure beneath the exposure of new monuments that would trumpet the aggressive expansion of Mexica territory. The Mexica shift from past artistic traditions where men were principally ideological accessories to the Templo Mayor was now being replaced with female supernaturals and emphasized the cult of their patron god, Huitzilopochtli. As the Mexica shifted their focus to areas outside of the basin, precisely the direction which Moticuzoma I was leading the political expansion, the Mexica may have thought this was also the time for an image shift. The move to quickly replace an anonymous defeated woman with more complex figures was the beginning of a trope the Mexica endlessly exploited. Defeated powerful women would appear in larger sizes from this point on as conjured in the spectacular Cuatlique and Tlaltecutli and Coyoshanqui monuments. Conclusion. The, the overview that I've just presented provides but a small version of a larger, much, much more complex terrain of monumentality that the Mexica explored. The Temple Mayor would, it be, would be one, fi and finally one um, shown once again, but in this particular case, immediately after its demise. This drawing that is done by, uh, attributed to Cortes to 1524, shows an entire um, aerial view or a planimetric view of the city of Tenochtitlan. The detail on the right shows that center section, that ceremonial section, and um, it shows a detail of it. And in there you can see the, the twin towers and the multiple layers of construction for the Temple Mayor. What you also see in front is a very large decapitated sculpture, clearly showing the intimate relation that existed between sculpture and this, this temple. Though that sculpture sits in a platform immediately in front, the closeness of that figure in adjacent to the stairs and to the, the base of the Templo Mayor emphasized the tableau, the monumental tableau that was the Templo Mayor. It is in a, a poetic irony that today, these wrecked relics slowly rise as the modern day sinks daily. And this final line that is drawn there is the present day ground line. And you can see how now the objects that were at one time beneath the ground line have now raised above. Excuse me, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was about to sneeze. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Elohio. So, for, for, yeah, for this great presentation, very interesting. Um, so I would like to invite uh, our audience to uh, write any questions that they might have uh, on the comments so we can pass them on uh, to Professor Guzman. And um, I don't know, Claudia, if you want to, while, while they're yeah. Uh, Sorry, I, I, maybe I, if you have any comments. Yeah, I I would love to. It's very very new material to me. Of course, I'm not a pre-Columbianist, right. but I think um, you bring um, a lot of very interesting ideas about monuments as well as like a, as a genre, and. Um, Maybe you could tell us a little bit of more about the the idea of visibility of of the Mexica Empire um, or a display and how it was because um, for me, of course, maybe I'm totally wrong, but it seemed like at least some of these uh, objects were offerings that would put like inside inside 
chambers. Yep. Absolutely. So who had access to them? What is the visibility, kind of the rights of looking, seeing, in a, and relating to these objects? Magnificent question. So there's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fabulous question. And in fact, it is precisely in trying to answer those questions that I've been asking these. So right from the beginning, the first thing is that practically most of the sculpture would have only been seen by a very narrow, very small group of people. Mm -hmm. More than likely, all of the elites who were being, of course, coerced into dominion. Mm -hmm. So that is what I, you know, so for instance, with regards to the Koyoshalki disc, which of course is massive, yeah. and you would have been able to see it, you would have had to have reached up to the platform and less than 1% of people got to that stage, right? And so, uh, but the, so the, the argument is that this was really a message to the gods. You don't spend all of this time <laughs> making this, you know, making these kinds of objects. If you are just, I, I'm sorry, I might be a cynic here. If these are messages merely to the gods, I mean, the fact that they finished that first version of that dismembered woman in a very simplistic fashion. And then within a very short period of time, I mean, we might be talking three to five years, they decided to make a much more elaborate rendition of her. And that continues to be repeated. And the best place where you would have seen it would have been obviously at the top of the temple. And that even narrows down further who is actually seeing this. But inversely, if you can think of the platform, right, which then, and we know this from ethno-historical sources, that oftentimes lords from competing and from, from uh, polities that the Mexica wanted to incorporate would be invited to see various different rituals. I guarantee you that they would have been the people who would have seen this. It's precisely why and now going to the very small offerings. The offerings are small, even the largest one, for instance, is, you know, I think it's like a meter and a half in length by just like 70 centimeters across. Um, so therefore that limits the amount of people who actually can in fact be around it. That image that I showed you, of, I believe is offering 126 with all those two tufted figures. Um, at most, I would say probably between, you know, eight or 10 people might have been able to see it at most. But what we're also not seeing is the pageantry that probably came along with it. And we also know because of the very precise excavation process that has gone through and the way in which they've extracted the objects, we are able to know that they, and this is why I use the, the word curate, a very contemporary kind of way of looking at it, but it is true that that's what they were doing. They were making these temporary exhibitions. And so that therefore it was for a very narrow group of people whom they were trying to convince. And this is where the argument then kind of folds in with the two tufted figure, because the two tufted figure repeats it, you know, only shows up interestingly up till now, they might actually show up in early excavations, but up to this point, they have not. They show up from the moment at which Motecuzoma starts to basically expand the, um, the, the, uh, the empire. And that's, I think, the reason why there are so many slight variations of them is because they actually represent maybe perhaps the, vis the people who were actually present making the objects and those would have been a few core elite, right? So what they did see, and that's where monumentality then kind of feeds in, is, and this would have been seen from all over because of the way in which the actual basin and the way in which the Mexica settled, because they settled in the basin at the lowest point, right, of this incredibly large kind of, you know, natural bowl, the one thing everybody would have seen would, be, would have been the Temple Mayor. And so therefore they kept feeding it and making it larger and larger. The problem was that of course, as they did that, it sunk because it was in the marshes. And so that would then put you in a situation where you perpetually had to then enlarge it. And then the thing that they did was then embellish it with larger sculptures on top that could be seen from farther and farther away. Thank Sorry, you. that was the long response. 
No, no, it was perfect. <laughs> so we have a, a question here uh, from Fernando Pesce. Uh, you can actually read it in the private chat uh, on the on the right. Uh, yeah. Uh, he says, Dear Professor Guzman, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, your talk today deals mostly with how the Mexica built political significance through their physical environment and massive sculptures. How can we relate it with the destruction of books and the new histories that are mentioned in ethno historical sources during the rule of, I hope I pronounced this right, it's Coatlet? It's Coatlet, yes. Yes. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Yes. So it's it, it's fascinating. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful point that he raises. I actually think it works perfectly. It's got is is the first um, emperor, so to speak. He's the first real kind of powerful dynast who very clearly is establishing these patterns, and that's one of the things that is very clear in the um, archaeological excavations. So one of the things that he does is he actually destroys burns there is a uh, there are several references that he collects most of the books the codices and destroys them of course the reason why he would do that is to control the narrative which is exactly what it is then that that gives him every authority to then reinvent to recreate and that's actually why i think this moment phase three construction to shift to phase four is so pivotal and that's where you see the break the rupture in the ways in which what has been was that what has been some of the patterns in the representation of humans to then shift to then more aggressive kind of representations of defeated enemies, because then there is that movement in that direction. And the burning of the codices allows them to then really control that narrative so that it's not countered in other ways. So it's a great question. Yeah. Thank you, perfect. And there's a, an actual a, a follow-up question after that. Um, how were the other massive sculptures uh, discovered in the 1790s uh, relate with the Templo Mayor precinct? Great question. Um, so, <laughs> in, in, right. So, um, the, the ones that he is actually um, laying out, um, the, which he asked about the Cuatlique, the Sunstone, and Tizoc Stone, um, they're all um, interrelated in different areas. So it's a little bit difficult because, of course, these are all found in different parts. The Cuatlique and the Sunstone were actually found um, near the, the, the front entrance to the um, uh, palace. But we know from very wonderful um, detailed work that has been done by several scholars, including Elizabeth Boone, Eduardo Matos, of course, and, um, and, and Leonardo Lopez Dujan, who have put out this magnificent tome that's called Monumental Mexica Sculpture. Highly, highly recommend that this person who's asking the question goes to look at that. They provide specific um, essays of each of these different objects and tell you their whole entire story as to when they were discovered, where they were discovered, and how they relate specifically to this. So the Kualikwa now is argued, um, and I think convincingly by Elizabeth Boone, that she is one of, we, we actually knew that there are several other manifestations of what Likwa and another one that is called the Yolo Likwa or the or, or heart skirt. There are fragments of her in um, the Templo, in the uh, Museum of Anthropology and there's actually one sculpture of the Yolo Likwa that is found there. We think that these were actually placed at the very top of the Templo Mayor. In fact, one of the illustrations that I showed from Leonardo Lopez Lucan's and Alfredo Lopez Austin's book shows these blocked out sculptures at the very top of the uh, Templo Mayor. Um, and, you know, and he, he can look at the, the others um, in, in those books, in, in that wonderful book. So it's, it's very, very complicated because of course, a lot of these sculptures, it's difficult to really be able to totally completely figure out where they are because some of them we know, like in the case of the Quatlique, where we're at the top, of the Temple Mayor, and then when they got destroyed, they were tumbled down. That's mm -hmm. why the actual work that has been done consistently now excavating the Temple Mayor is the best, most wonderful information that we have because it's actually excavating things in relationship to their original placement. That's the best kind of information. That's why the Koshnaki and the Tlaltecuhtli are so incredibly important. Of course, the sunstone is is, is incredibly so, and so is the, the T-Sock, but there are others like it as well. 
Thank you. Uh, Claudia? Yeah, no, um, I have another question um, about the status of these sculptures. Yeah. Um, were, they, were they like representative sculptures, like meant to be seen in red? Or did they have some kind of like agency or you know what I mean, or power? Yeah. Like I, I'm thinking about this, the movement of bringing, of representing subjugated cultures and putting them inside the temple, right. but that in some way um, also meant a kind of sharing power through these objects or, or, or this is just really a visual representation. It's not just merely visual. I think yeah. it's it's part of a larger negotiation. I mean, um, of, of of politics that is taking place. So you just hit, and, and your questions are fabulous because you're <laughs> you're you're allowing me to expand more the, the the very complicated nature of these sculptures. So on the one hand, it's very clear that just the question that you asked about visibility that it's very limited. However, the Mexica went to great lengths to really actually accent certain elements. So for instance, the Koyoshalki, which you see there in partial just in the, in the um, carving, what you're missing there is the high and very simplistic could be seen coloration, but it's actually very sophisticated. She lays essentially all the high relief areas are in color, the, the, the low relief is all done in red. So when you would have seen it, you would have read it as being in a pool of blood. All of her skin is bright yellow, so it would have immediately jumped out. So even if you weren't at that platform looking at it from afar, you would have been able to read some of it. You know, there are elements, very, very few elements that are that are colorized with, you know, yellow or blue accents or red accents to precisely really kind of emphasize and heighten. The Mexica, used a very, very limited color palette, but in very efficacious ways. So for instance, the Temple of Mayor was completely covered in white, right? So it shimmered precisely so that everybody would see it in the middle of this lake. And as it was growing, it would be basically kind of glowing, right? And then to articulate the shrines, they painted just bands, very clearly, beautifully kind of, you know, painted designs of shelves, for the water, for the for you know the 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 uh, and 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 fire elements for the temple of the rain versus the temple of fire, right? The temple of, of of war. So there is that. As far as it's sort of now this the 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 symbolic associations with these, I absolutely believe the reason why it is that they are using so many such a wide variety of styles, also an incredibly divergent use of materials. Materials that are coming from all over the place. That then what they are doing is they're then painting designs over them to unify them. But then they're also making references very specific. And this is the most wonderful part of being able to have a chronology is that we were able, one of one archaeologist by the name of Tisok Melgar, um, uh, Melgar Tisok, sorry, he has been doing petrographic analysis. So high, you know, kind of um, uh, I'm sorry, his name is Emiliano Melgar Tisok. Sorry about that. But he has been doing high, you know, um, uh, um, concentration uh, microscopic analysis to find the, the kind of manufacturing that kinds of, of, of um, um, uh, traits in these sculptures. And what he has done, he's been able to find. Um, like in the case of these penates sculptures, penates, which are these very small sculptures from Oaxaca that he has been focusing on that we have them in archaeological deposits that date to a period of time where we actually know who were the different towns that were being, um, uh, that were being uh, conquered. The chronology is off. So the Mexica are emulating sculptures of people they haven't yet conquered. But, and also what's interesting is that typically the penacas are this large, you know, between 15 and, and 18, 20 centimeters. Whereas the penacas that are being manufactured at the Templo Mayor are 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 centimeters. And the reason why that is, is because more than likely I guarantee you, is because they were showing it 
to a group of people and saying, these people are now incorporated. And that kind of a thing, it's very clear that what you're actually seeing in these deposits is a map of the territories of the empire's growth. And this is nothing that's new. I mean, this is very common in the Roman Empire. This is, everybody does this. So it was a high stakes political negotiation that they were doing precisely. And the, they were utilizing art in a very sophisticated fashion to convey a wide layering of messaging, political messaging. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. yeah. Um, um taking advantage of this uh, point that uh, Claudia raised, uh, I was uh, very interested and fascinated by the, the idea of a, a dynamic temple and, and not just in, in, in like uh, centuries, but also like the idea of constantly building and rebuilding and remodeling and adding and changing. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about more about that, because yeah. you mentioned uh, uh, um, that there were some connections with some idea of nature of the mountains and uh, that was in the legends. And yes. so, so how how this? Uh, because if uh, very few people actually saw the the works close, the mm -hmm. the distant view. Uh, would have a very uh, different impact and right so so there's so, also so it's, it's visibility from a distance and the connection with the environment so so that's what Absolutely. i, I so, was wondering great question so <laughs> the, the the temple mayor itself just as what i had mentioned earlier um the the marvelous book by leonardo by alfredo lopez austin leonardo lopez Duhan really draws out the the big kind of associations that exist between this temple and the sacred mm -hmm. mountain, right? And mm -hmm. to the Mexica, you know, and, and to most um, Mesoamerican cultures, the landscape was sacred. And mm -hmm. of course it was ancestral in many cases. And in this particular case, there were certain mountains that were particularly special because they fit within a larger, more important kind of ideological construct of mythology, mythologizing that made reference to specific myths so like in the case of the the Batepec, the snake mountain that was the place where their god was born there were many many other references there were mountains of sustenance right what are called tonacatepet and and mm -hmm. um those were primordial places but the temple mayor also played that role interestingly enough there is yeah. there's a lot of there's in other words it was the mountain that basically represented everything because of the way in which it was growing, right? And so there, therefore, it was really important to incorporate the landscape. That's where I think it is that, and that's why I showed that picture of the various different kinds of stones that are being utilized to actually incorporate because what they're doing is they're bringing materials from farther and farther out from different places. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting about it is when you look at different stages of construction, you will see a wide variety of divergent kind of elements within it. And what's really interesting about it is, of course, it's that much harder to build with different materials. The engineering mm -hmm. is much more complicated, right? But the fascinating thing about it, this is where the white plaster really played a role because then it bound everything together mm -hmm. and now made it a cohesive whole. In essence, it kind of now was the final moment of saying, we're one, and at that moment, that marked the beginning of the next stage of construction. So it was, you know, it was in essence kind of resonating the areas. And so it also makes every perfect sense. And that's why I also was talking about the migration. The Mexica are foreigners. Mm -hmm. They're coming from the north, which means that as they're coming in, they're seeing the diverse landscape. And that is one of the reasons why it is that they're aware that there is a larger political kind of entity out that they want to incorporate. And so hence, also in terms of the landscape, um, they, they, will, they will end up basically taking the two most powerful, you know, elements in that basin, which is water and fire, right? Yeah. That becomes a symbol that is unified in the Temple Mayor itself, both in the top, but then also there is this idea of empire. And that is to say the whole kind of larger entity, which they referred to as Sem Anawa, 
one by the water or one bound by water. And that mm -hmm. clearly gives you an idea of how expansive they were. And in the offerings, all of the offerings always start at the very base, at the very bottom with an, with a, um, an element of water. They, they have mm -hmm. fine sand and then, you know, marine kind of uh, fish and also uh, uh, corals. And then they yeah. do a terrestrial kind of, yeah, they then lay like a terrestrial kind of um, uh, cultural mm -hmm. plane. That's where the temple, where the uh, two tufted figure would often reside at the very top. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that, some offerings, those would be kept with avian and with aviary creatures with these like eagles oh. and on oh, top. So it was like this cosmic sandwich to emphasize the entire world being encapsulated and being captured. In the temple. Right. Wow. And so, and that emphasizes the vertical axis and the objects emphasize the horizontal kind of territorial kind of ways. So it was this, this spectacular kind of cosmic pill that each one of these offerings was repeatedly kind of making. And that's why that's why I referred to them as as you know as curated exhibitions because they really yeah. truly were. There was a moment in time before it was completely covered, where it would have been viewed by a very narrow group of people. Yeah. But nevertheless, I mean, you know, you 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 all know examples of famous exhibitions that were only seen by a handful of people. <laughs> yeah. And then are immortalized. True. <laughs> very true. <laughs> Claudia. No, I just, um, I'm interested about the offerings. As I said, I, I know nothing about this, but right. they were like, um, it was performatic, like they were building it while they show it, or it was like they would build it and then people would see it. It's great. It's a great question. So the very fine work of Leonardo Lopez Lucan and also Matos and the ways in which they supervise these excavations, which are still going on and they're still finding amazing, mm -hmm. remarkable elements matos was able to identify and this was the thing that was great as they were clearing sometimes they would find sculpt they would find offerings in between like for instance the offering of the of the figures that are descending the stairways those were mm -hmm. sandwiched in between and those are that's one of the reasons why we know that that's sort of like a what we call a a, a, a a terminal offering or a killing offering and that is to say because they reside on the on the final steps right their place and then they were covered with very fine sand to make sure that they weren't destroyed mm -hmm. and then the rubble of the building that then gets built is placed on top okay so there's that kind of offering that's placed on the building and then there are in the most of the offerings what they did was after the building was completed they actually would come back and break the plaster floor and would make the deposits they're very, very, very consistent about everything about offerings always lining up with the center of stairs, with the center of the temple, with the corners of the temple. And that's one of the reasons why they're, they're waiting until it's done is because they want to make sure that they are really hitting it precisely. And so that there, this is, in essence, one could kind of begin to create a chronology there in terms of like when the building is built, and then the kinds of celebrations that then would have taken place afterwards. That raises a very interesting point, which I hadn't considered in terms of audience, because the stairs might have been like bleachers where people could have sat and looked at upon different areas. I have never kind of thought of that. There's a lot of things to, to, to consider in that, but but I mean, and and you know, that's pure speculation. But 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 nevertheless, it's very, very, very clear that um there had to have been all different kinds of performative act, acts that came along with this, right? And then mm -hmm. that is to say, there's a great array of um, flora and certain liquids that have disappeared that we're not able to get, that we weren't didn't get for the first, so um, for the first kind of excavation process of the Temple Mayo of 1978, because archeological, kind of um, uh, uh, practices back then didn't really do what is known as soil analysis and flotation analysis. And that is to say that they would have saved the soils to then analyze them to see what kind of nutrients and that gives them an idea as to what other objects were actually found that were biodegradable. And in um, the earlier 
offerings. We don't we don't have that because the archaeologists were following. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were amazing for what they did, but they were basically following protocol, and that was they re removed the earth, and were only interested in mm -hmm. the objects that were there. Of course, that's normal. Um, the recent kind of work that has taken place in the last 25, 30 years, I'd have to look exactly as to when, it, when the first flotation analysis starts, but that's where we were able to finally begin to realize that there were a wide variety of flowers. That, mm -hmm. And we have very specific, they're very, very specific about the kinds of flowers mm -hmm. that are being laid out in areas and areas you know, and, and the various different kinds of, also blood was presented in some cases, there were all different kinds of sure. different uh, oblations that were given. And this is this amazing, remarkable work that these that this great group of archaeologists has been doing. And um, I can't say enough about the ways by which they are so conscientiously, constantly looking to see what else they can extract. So every time, every new offering that gets excavated gives us much, much more information than the previous one because we have greater, mm. you know, um, technology, better, you know, um, uh, scientific tools. Um, and because we're building on that legacy, but you know, um, what they got initially is admirable because there still is, I mean, there is still so much material. This, this, this place is so wealthy and, and, in abundant information that, you know, um, I actually don't know, I, I should have looked this up, but there's a wonderful, um, uh, uh, bibliography um, in this book that, that's called Revolución del Templo Mayor, in, uh, which was just published, I believe it was two or three years ago, which has a bibliography of all of the projects, all of the articles of everything that's been done. It's, it's really impressive. And it's especially impressive in that for all that we know, we still have these wonderful questions that have to be answered. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are uh, running out of time, so we have time for one last question. And uh, we have it here from the audience. Um, how can we associate this form of indigenous archaeology and reuse of ancient objects with the political inclusion of the Mexica? Great question. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, I mentioned um, a lot of scholars, Emily Umberger, among them, uh, Leonardo Lopez Lujan, uh, uh, have written quite a bit about this um, in this fascination in terms of how, you know, how do you deal with the past? It's very clear that the Mexica, for the objects, we have a lot of objects that are actually deposited at the Templo Mayor that very clearly tell us that they had an interest in archaeology. They were, had an interest in going back and excavating. I mean, in the case of, of Teotihuacan, it's not at all surprising because in their in the in the 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 ethno history tales of their myth we are told that they lived they settled for some time in Teotihuacan and you know when they got there there were probably surely many many objects that were just on the surface but we know actually that they act they did in fact tunnel into several different buildings because we have archaeologists have been able to find like for instance at the temple of Quetzalcoatl which is a very prominent and the most a lavishly decorated temple at the Tihuacan, archaeologists actually intercepted an Aztec trench that they had dug to extract objects. And so, like I showed you that mask, there are several other masks, there's several different other ceramics, there's different things that were actually taken from there and brought. Now, what they don't know, or what we don't know, is what did the Mexica know about them in relationship to, you know, were they a culture that was a thousand years before them? They knew it was very ancient because they write about it. They, in fact, are the ones who named Teotihuacan. They name it the city of gods based on their own kind of presumptions about what they're finding. So it's amazing in terms of thinking about how the indigenous are reflecting on their own history. You know, the, the Olmec mask is very difficult to date. Um, and there's debates as to whether it is. 300 years old or if it's actually a thousand years old and as to whether they also knew whether or even old if not not also as to whether they knew that whether this object really was from the area of the what is known as Olmen 
and that is in the Gulf Coast of where the, the greater concentration of Olmec sites are, or if it comes from other areas where we know there were sort of like Olmec kind of villages or, or, or satellite cities. Uh, and so that makes it very, very difficult. They're, they also, it's fascinating, they have different approaches to objects. In some, on, in some cases, they have total full reverence for them. Like for instance, in the case of Teotihuacan, they'll do very little kind of articulation of it. In that case, like for instance, all they do is they inlay the eyes. It's already, the cavity is there and they inlay the teeth. In other cases, like in, the, in they, we have a lot of, mes, of, of uh, Guerrero um, Mescala figures. They actually go in and we have these wonderfully, just beautiful kind of like greenstone figures that are very, very minimally re rendered. They come in and they paint the identical visage of the rain god on all of these objects. So it's different kinds of approaches. It, with some, there seems to be this total kind of like, well, this is something that's so tremendously important. And others, it's like, we're just going to go ahead and now make you part of us. So it's, it's a very, 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 very different kind of approach, which is why I make the argument that I'm making. And that is that they were very self-conscious about the different political statements that they were making to different regions at different times. So thank you for that question. <laughs> I also oh. think the question, just the last comment, the question um, is about contemporary indigenous uh, people in Mexico, in Mexico City. Right. I'm, I don't know. That's how I understood, you know, what okay. the importance of art of these archaeologies, uh, archaeological findings, and um, for for the history of indigenous. It's, yeah, in that in that this is a very sticky, complicated issue, because um, regretfully the Mexica are often presented as incredibly nationalistic and representative of of, of Mexico. Of course, I've heard um, it being referred in this way because this is a culture that is not shared with any other Middle American countries, right? It's less so with the Maya. The Maya are shared among Guatemala, Honduras, and, but the Mexica are exclusively Mexican. And they, of course, do what? Dominate all <laughs> other indigenous cultures. Uh -huh. <laughs> Until, of course, the indigenous cultures get together and overthrow <laughs> Uh -huh. and, 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 and that's the, the, the kind of amazing parallel with modern day politics where many indigenous um, peoples complain about the focus that is given just specifically to the center because that's the capital. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the, the, the kinds of ways in which we know so much about the Mexica um, and how, much, how, how less we know about other cultures. Um, there's a there's actually a, a very good argument for that, and I think they're correct. But there's also the inverse, and that is that we've been given a very unique opportunity there in this center to have this dedicated excavation process. That you know, of course, it's also let's face it, money has everything to do with it. What doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. And so, of course, it's it's the Mexican government and you know, probably tourism, I would imagine, also plays a very important role here um, in terms of being able to have, and also, I mean, let's just face it, they're really spectacular, sensational discoveries. But uh, inversely, I can tell you there have been remarkable discoveries that have been made in Teotihuacan that have been made now in various different areas now that unfortunately that this Maya train <laughs> that's being built out to, you know, to the Yucatan Peninsula from the center of Mexico They've hit upon an enormous array of archaeological remains, and there's not that same kind of focus as is on this. So um, it raises these very sticky fundamental issues about government. But the truth is, these are the very same arguments that the Mexica were kind of trying to negotiate. And hence, I mean, I, it's, it's so fascinating then to see it through that prism and see how they were overthrown precisely because they were ineffective in the end of really understanding the very polities that they were incorporating and ingesting. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Okay. So thank you very much for the questions. I'm sorry that I went so long with the responses, but I, no, no, that's a great thank question. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> we are very, very happy to to have you here and to have listened to to all of this wonderful material. Yeah, so, yeah. Really, really fascinating, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So with this, we conclude this this session. And we invite uh, everyone to stay tuned for uh, the next one that's going to take place in January. We are uh, advertising it pretty soon. So stay tuned for that. And thank you so much. And see you next time. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, is it Bon Natal? Uh, or how do you guys say it? Yeah. Uh, Merry Christmas. Feliz Natal. Feliz Natal. <laughs> okay. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Y prospero año nuevo. Gracias. Gracias. Hasta luego. Adiós. Yeah.